Amen. Certainly a fitting prayer, always. It's a joy to be with you again, and I want to bring greetings from my dear wife, Lori. She's not able to be with me tonight. Uh, For a little more than a year, since August of 2020, we have unexpectedly been caregiving for her elderly parents who came to live with us because they were evacuated from fires in the Santa Cruz area. And uh, her mom, in God's providence, uh, was in hospice care for a number of months. She passed away at the end of January in Christ. She was a believer in Christ, so we give thanks for that. Uh, But Lori's stepdad is still with us, and he's going to be 99 in a few months. Her mom was 94, and so uh, she's home helping to care for him this evening. So she sends her greetings and her regrets. She very much wanted to be here, but the Lord had other plans, and so uh, that's where she's at, and she sends her greetings. And I also want to bring you greetings from our church body at River City Grace. Brothers and sisters there uh, send their greetings as well. We have a lot of happy, wonderful, blessed ties with IBC through the years, and uh, we're very, very grateful to co-labor together. And so they send their greetings as well. I know we just sang a prayer, but I want to pray once again before we look to God's Word. Genesis 23 is where we're going to be tonight. Genesis 23, a sermon entitled, Death, Grief, and Covenant Hope. But let me lead us in prayer again as we look to God's Word. Our Father, Your Word is the Word of life. And even as we have sung and prayed that you would speak to us, we do and pray that you would do that. And we pray that your word would go forth now faithfully, clearly, giving strength and life to all who would hear. We pray this in the name of Jesus, the living word, amen and amen. Excuse me. Genesis chapter 23. I think all of us know and Understand how sorrowful and how sad it is to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, is it not? It seems that we're never far from heartbreaking news of death. Death from wars and crimes and diseases. Death from earthquakes and tornadoes and floods. Death from accidents, overdoses and Old age, just yesterday I was at a memorial service for the 19-year-old son of a dear friend who died from an apparent accidental overdose. And perhaps even now, you or others that you know are facing those sorrows that are like sea billows that roll. Indeed, like the wildfire smoke that recently blanketed the Sacramento Valley, the whole world is smothered by the choking stench of death. Its gloom is inescapable, often overwhelming us with hopelessness and despair. Well, I want you to know that the fresh air of covenant hope from God pours out in Genesis chapter 23, even as it does in all of His Word. And the text we're going to look at tonight comes near the end of the Abraham cycle of stories in Genesis, those stories with Abraham which begin in Genesis 12 and continue midway through chapter 25. Death is indeed the context at the end of this cycle of stories. Genesis 23, as we're going to see, is about the death of Abraham's dear beloved wife, Sarah, And then Genesis 24 is about how their son Isaac, grieving his mother's death, was comforted in marrying Rebekah. And then chapter 25 is about the death of Abraham himself. And so death marks these stories. But we also find here sunny, radiant, clear blue skies of covenant hope which God would have us to see and to be strengthened with through faith. So let's hear the word of our living God in Genesis 23, beginning at verse 1, and I'm going to read to the end of the chapter. Sarah lived 127 years, and these were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died at Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And Abraham rose up from before his dead and said to the Hittites, I am a sojourner and foreigner among you. Give me property among you for a burying place that I may bury my dead out of my sight. The Hittites answered, Abraham, hear us, my Lord. 
You are a prince of God among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our tombs. None of us will withhold from you his tomb to hinder you from burying your dead. Abraham rose and bowed to the Hittites, the people of the land. And he said to them, if you are willing that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat for me Ephron, the the son of Zohar, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he owns. It is at the end of his field. For the full price, let him give it to me in your presence as property for a burying place. Now Ephron was sitting among the Hittites, and Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the hearing of the Hittites, of all who went in at the gate of his city. No, my Lord, hear me. I give you the field, and I give you the cave that is in it. In the sight of the sons of my people, I give it to you. Bury your dead." Verse 12, well, then Abraham bowed down before the people of the land, and he said to Ephron in the hearing of the people of the land, but if you will hear me, I give the price of the field. Accept it from me that I may bury my dead there. Ephron answered Abraham, my Lord, listen to me. A piece of land worth 400 shekels of silver, what is that between you and me? Bury your dead. Abraham listened to Ephron, and Abraham weighed out for Ephron the silver that he had named in the hearing of the Hittites, 400 shekels of silver, according to the weights current among the merchants. And so the field of Ephron in Machpelah, which was to the east of Mamre, the field with the cave that was in it, and all the trees that were in the field throughout its whole area was made over to Abraham as a possession in the presence of the Hittites, before all who went in at the gate of his city. After this, Abraham buried his wife in the cave of the field of Machpelah, east of Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. The field and the cave that is in it were made over to Abraham as property for a burying place by the Hittites. And this is the word of the Lord. Well, what is it that God is revealing to us in this text? Is this just a sad yet interesting story with some curious historical facts about how people in the ancient Near East buried their dead and and about how business transactions took place? Should real estate agents, lawyers, and morticians take note? Well, what's going on? Well, remember that the New Testament tells us in Romans chapter 15, verse 4, that whatever was written in former days, referring to the Old Testament scriptures, was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. And so God has given Genesis 23 within all His Word to instruct us and to encourage our endurance motivating hope, our hope in Him. And of course, nowhere can life feel more immobilizing and more hopeless than when the unwelcomed visitor of death has arrived. Death is the context of Genesis chapter 23. And as we know, death is the tragic context of our fallen world. But here's the main central lesson that we find in Genesis 23. It is this, faith faces death with covenant hope. Faith faces death with covenant hope. This is how Abraham faced the death of Sarah And this is what God desires for all His people, to know the covenant hope of walking by faith in Him. Now, the lesson of the text that faith faces death with covenant hope, it unfolds in the text in two parts, and that's what I want us to look at tonight, these two parts of how faith faces death with covenant hope. So here's part number one. Faith walks in the realities of certain death. Faith walks in the realities of certain death. And God's people by faith are indeed called to walk in, to live in these realities of certain death. In other words, faith understands that the inevitable death 
of ourselves and of others that we love and that we know, it cannot be avoided. And so faith doesn't deny it. Faith doesn't minimize it. Faith doesn't try to escape from death. Rather, Abraham, the father of faith, shows us how faith must face the realities of death. And so after more than 60 years of marriage, at the age of 127 years old, we're told, Sarah dies in Hebron in God's promised land of Canaan. And though Abraham did not yet own any land there, he had settled there many years earlier in obedience to God's command, trusting God's promises. And so in Abraham's response to Sarah's death, we see two specific realities of death that have to be faced. First of all, understandably, there are the crushing emotional realities of death. We just can't avoid it. And so you see in verse 2 there in chapter 23, Abraham mourned over the lifeless body of his wife Sarah. And he wept for her. The floodgates of tears burst open. Now this is the first time that we're told that Abraham cried. No doubt it would not be the last. Was Abraham's intense grief wrong? Was it an indication of weakness that maybe he wasn't trusting God? Were his tears, in other words, were they contrary to his faith? And the answer, of course, is absolutely not. Abraham had walked by faith with God for many years by the time Sarah died. And his faith, through which he was counted righteous by God, as we're told back in chapter 15, verse 6, His faith had grown, it had matured, and it had been strengthened greatly over the years. And if you know anything about the story of God's dealings with Abraham, you know that he did not have perfect faith. He had real faith, but it was not perfect. It needed to grow and mature and be strengthened. In fact, Genesis chapter 22 has just shown us the deepening confidence of Abraham's faith as he obeyed God's command to sacrifice Isaac, the son of promise, and Abraham was about to follow through with that, fully trusting that God would provide, even as he did. Well, now, many years later, after that event, by faith, he's facing Sarah's death, and he's crying, and he's crying, and he's crying. And so it was not a lack of faith, but it was in faith that he mourned. His heart was broken. Because Sarah was gone, and he didn't fight, and he didn't hide his emotions. And so, beloved, among other things, this is a reminder that genuine faith in God is not incongruous with deep grief. Remember that in his incarnation, Jesus was a man of sorrows. He was acquainted with grief, as we're told in Isaiah 53. Remember how Jesus wept at the tomb of Lazarus in John chapter 11, and certainly he wept for more reasons than just death, but certainly not less. And so it is right, it is fitting, it's appropriate to grieve the death of those that we love, to not try to be stoic or unemotional or detached. Death is painful and death is abnormal. Death is not a natural part of life as many would have us to believe. Death is a result of God's curse upon sin as Genesis chapter 2 and 3 makes clear. Beloved, death is ugly, it is hideous, and it is tragic beyond description. And yes, for any who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ... We have the living hope of salvation and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And yes, this hope takes away the sting of death for God's people. But we are not shielded from the agony, from the sorrow, from the heartbreak of death. And so faith faces the emotional realities that death brings. Realities of unspeakable grief, of uncontrollable tears, and of indescribable loss and loneliness. 
Friends, if someone that you love has died, grieve. Grieve before God. Grieve whenever you feel like grieving. And take your sadness and take your tears and take your numbing sense of loss to God. He welcomes that. In fact, in Psalm 62, verse 8, he invites us to trust in him at all times and to pour out our hearts before him. Know God in Christ to be your faithful and constant refuge. And I know as many can testify, often the grief over the death of a loved one only seems to intensify over time. We simply don't get over the loss of someone that we love, but we can move forward in faith. And so if you know someone who is grieving the death of a loved one, as most of us do, be wise and be thoughtful and be loving towards them. Don't be careless, don't be insensitive, don't be unhelpful with words and actions. Surely God's counsel through the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 12, verse 15, is as profound as it is always timely, namely that we should simply learn to weep with those who weep. And so first, there are emotional realities of death that faith must face. But second, as we see in the text, along with the emotional realities, there are also functional realities, functional realities of death that faith must faith face. Your life doesn't stop, and you have to deal with lots of practical details. Sadly, you have to bury your dead, and you have to deal with financial issues and a host of other things. And within these functional realities, you also have to deal with lots of other people who likely don't feel your pain and who don't share your grief. And so this is what happens with Abraham in verses 3 through 20 as he buys a burial place for Sarah, his wife. And so amid his grief, Abraham initiates dialogue with the Hittite leaders for a place to bury his dead. They're the ones who legally own the land where Abraham lived, so to them he must go. And this begins an intriguing process of haggling that ends with Abraham buying a field with a cave from a man named Ephron the Hittite. And the whole transaction likely typifies common business practices of the day. Now, it's interesting, though the Hittites may appear to be generous in what they first offer Abraham, what they really seem to want is for him to use one of their tombs, but without actually purchasing and owning it. Well, Abraham, no doubt aware that this would bring problems later, he shrewdly and politely presses them to secure the purchase of a burial spot that he presumably knew of owned by Ephron. And the price of 400 shekels of silver was paid, likely a highly inflated price. But Abraham did not lack wealth, and so for the first time in his life, he legally owned property in the land that God had promised him. And so he buries Sarah in a cave in the land of Canaan. Now, all of this has great spiritual and covenantal significance, and I'm going to say more about it later. But for now, simply observe that by faith, Abraham walked in the emotional and functional realities of Sarah's death. He didn't deny his grief, and he didn't neglect his responsibilities. By faith, he moved forward and did what had to be done, no doubt with frequent tears. But he kept walking by faith. In fact, he would go on living almost 40 more years after Sarah's death. And so faith faces death with covenant hope. The first part of the lesson within that means that faith walks in the emotional and the functional realities of certain death. But if you've ever had to experience this kind of walk, you may be asking the question, but how? 
How does faith do that? Where does the motivation and the power for facing death in that way come from? Well, this is answered in the second part of the lesson, which we also see distinctively in Abraham's life. And so here's part two, faith walks in the assurance of covenant hope. Part one, faith walks in the emotional and functional realities of death. Part two, faith walks in the assurance of covenant hope. And so by faith, Abraham walked in the realities of Sarah's death because he walked in the assurance of covenant hope. You see, it would have been customary for a foreigner like Abraham, upon the death of his wife, to return to his earthly homeland to bury her. But for Abraham, his determination to buy property and to bury Sarah in Canaan showed the resolve of his faith. It showed the assurance of his covenant hope in God. Abraham was trusting God to fulfill his covenant promises, and so in a giant step of faith, he purchases a burial site for Sarah in the land that God had promised. Now, Sarah's death happened some 62 years after God had first called Abraham. And God had given great promises and great commands to Abraham, first speaking to him back in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. And there God says to him, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And so in that initial call, God says, go. And he promises Abraham land And that he'll become a great nation and that God will bless him, making his name great so that in Abraham all the families of the earth would be blessed. Well, as the narrative goes on from there surrounding Abraham, it shows God expanding and confirming and beginning to fulfill these very promises. And as I've mentioned, it also shows the growing maturity and obedience of Abraham's faith. And so, for instance, in chapter 13, in verses 14 to 17, after Abraham had taken a faithless detour to Egypt, God providentially sends him back to Canaan, and then God assures him by saying there in chapter 13, verse 14 and following, God says, lift up your eyes, look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward, for all the land that you see I will give to you and to your offspring forever." I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring also can be counted. He says, arise, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. See how he's reaffirming and strengthening his promises. Well, then over in chapter 15, God further assures Abraham by enshrining his promises in a formal covenant performing a dramatic ceremony in which God Himself takes full responsibility to keep the covenant. Dr. Thomas Schreiner says that a covenant is a, quote, chosen relationship in which two parties make binding promises to each other. Well, that's in effect what God is doing with Abraham, except God in this instance in Genesis 15 is taking all the responsibility. Now, of course, as you know, many more years would pass with many other parts of the story before Isaac, God's promised offspring, would be born to Abraham and Sarah in their old age. And we're told about his birth at the beginning of Genesis 21. But when we come to Genesis 23 and the death of Sarah, the promise of possessing of possessing the land still awaits for f- fulfillment. And of course, Sarah dies. Now, in chapter 23, it's noteworthy to see that there are two bookend references to the land of Canaan, one in verse 2, and then again near the end of the narrative in verse 19. And these references to Canaan really emphasize the point of the whole chapter, namely that in the context of Sarah's death, And for the first time since Genesis chapter 12, Abraham becomes the legal owner of a tiny part of Canaan, the promised land. 
And it's emphasized in the way the narrative unfolds throughout the story as well. But so God had begun in a very small way to fulfill his promises of land to Abraham and his descendants. And so Abraham buries Sarah in Canaan, and as he does, he is in essence planting the covenant hope of future generations. You see, Abraham knew that God would fulfill all his promises. And so it was an act of profound faith for him to bury Sarah and to do so in land that he had now taken legal possession of. He knew God would fulfill his promises, but he probably also knew that he, like Sarah, wouldn't see the fulfillment of those promises in his lifetime. And he knew that death, however, could not kill the promises of God. He knew that God's promises don't die at the grave. Or as John Calvin has said, death was not an obstacle to the promises of God. And so in Genesis 23, when Abraham declares to the Hittites in verse 4 that he's a sojourner and a foreigner among them, he was likely thinking of even more than just his earthly address. By faith, he was thinking about the better heavenly country yet to come. And you see, this was his assured covenant hope. Now, we know this because of what we're told in Hebrews chapter 11. And listen to what verses 13 to 16 say with reference to Abraham and Sarah, among others. It says there, Hebrews 11 verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. And if they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared for them a city. You see, this was the horizon, the highest horizon in heaven of Abraham's hope. Faith faces death with covenant hope. And so God wants us to see and to be strengthened by the assured hope of Abraham's faith. This is our faith and hope if indeed we're trusting Christ. And God also wanted the original readers of Genesis to see it. In other words, those Jews to whom Moses, who was the likely author of Genesis along with the rest of the Pentateuch, was writing as as God is preparing them to enter into the full possession of the promised land. And that generation who would have been the original audience of Genesis, they lived almost 500 years after the time of Abraham. And they were to see themselves within the flow of all of God's promises to Abraham. And they were to keep trusting God and they were to keep moving forward in obedient faith because He's the unchanging God and He's still at work and His promises never fail. And so these original readers, think about it, they had witnessed the deaths of the whole generation of their parents in the wilderness because of their parents' unbelief. They had witnessed all of that. But now they, like Abraham, by faith, were to walk in the realities of these deaths and yet to walk in the assurance of covenant hope. And beloved, for any of us who are, by God's grace, partakers of this hope by faith, we are also to walk in this covenant hope that has been come to fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ. By faith, we must walk in the realities of death, but also in the assurance of covenant hope because we also are to understand that we live in the flow of these very same promises. And we see how God has brought all of these promises now to fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so with Paul in 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20, we say amen for all the promises of God, as he says there, find their yes in Christ. And as we trust and rely on the constant help that we need and receive from Jesus, our merciful and faithful high priest, that help, we trust that in the words of Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 to 18, that through his death, 
He has destroyed the one who has the power of death. That is the devil. And as that text in Hebrews 2 also says, he has accomplished our propitiation. He has made us favorable to God because he has satisfied the wrath of God in his own death. And in that, he has also destroyed the one who has the power of death, the devil. You see, that's the basis. That's the content. That's the substance of our covenant hope. And so as God has fulfilled all of His promises in Jesus Christ, we now await the final consummation of these promises when Jesus returns. And we long for and we look for the day when Jesus will bring final eternal judgment on all His enemies who have rejected Him. And we long for and we look for the day when God with King Jesus will bring the new heaven and the new earth where God will dwell together with His people in perfect joyful righteousness forever and ever and ever. And in that very hope, we long for that day when He will indeed wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And that hope is described for us there in Revelation 21, verse 4. But until then, like Abraham, and as God did with Abraham, He is working to mature and strengthen our obedient faith in Him. We know God will make good on all that He has promised because He has already brought so many promises to fulfillment in Christ. And we also know that unless Christ returns, we likely won't see it in our lifetime. We know that we too will die in faith as all who have gone before us, but the same God who who carried Abraham along carries us along because he's unchanging and he's still at work and his promises never fail. He's at work within the specific circumstances he has ordained for each and every one of us. He's at work through the Holy Spirit. He's at work through His Word. He's at work through the mutual ministry of our brothers and sisters in Christ in the local church as we grow in loving and spurring one another on in faith. And He's at work in us to bear witness of Christ to a sinful, hopeless, dying world. God is still at work helping us to live with the faith that faces death in covenant hope. Well, all of this brings us to a key question that the text really holds before us. And the question is this, dear friends, where do you live? Where do you live? Of course, I'm not talking about what city, what state, or what country you might live in, or whether you live in a house, or an apartment, or a trailer, or a tent, or maybe today in a boat. Not asking about where you live in that sense, but where do you live in your soul? Where do you live in your soul? Is it well, friend, with your soul? Are you living and growing in this faith, in the faith that faces death in the covenant hope of God's promises fulfilled in Jesus Christ? Faith that can say with the Apostle Paul in Philippians 1 verse 21, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Are you living and growing in this faith and in this hope? Are you trusting and rejoicing in God's promised presence and help for your every need day by day? Would people look at your life and see evidence of this faith and of this hope? Would they see it in the way you spend your time and your money? Would they see it in your desires and ambitions? Would they see it in your relationships? And would they hear it in your conversations? Would they see it in the way you are at work and at school and in the local church and in your neighborhood and at home? Would they see it in the way that you face death and grief? Are you living, are you growing in this faith of this covenant hope? Or is it possible for some of you that you're living in the hopeless unbelief that tries to avoid any thought of death at all costs? The unbelief that ultimately is enslaved to the terrifying fear of death because you know that death is unavoidable and you also know in your heart that death means 
God's judgment. Hebrews 9 verse 27 says, It's appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. And so in your soul, if you're not a believer in Christ, you know that physical death is but the entrance to the eternal death of hell. But friend, you can permanently, this instant, be delivered from your bondage to this fear right now by acknowledging your sin and turning to Jesus Christ in faith. Scripture declares, you probably know this verse in John chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. And perishing there is in contrast to eternal life. So it doesn't just mean that you kind of go into non-existence. To perish means to experience eternal death. But if you trust Christ, if you believe on Him, you can have eternal life. If you've never trusted Him, come to Him now by faith. Call out to Him. Come out of the deadly smoke of sin and death into the fresh air of eternal life in Christ. He will welcome you and forgive you and cleanse you. His promises are true. So, beloved, faith faces death in covenant hope. Walking by faith in the realities of certain death and walking in the assurance of covenant hope, if you think about it, it is a simultaneous experience. And so it is that when your faith and your hope is fixed on God and His promises, you can and you will persevere even through the deepest, darkest valley of grief. And of course, there's no denying the grief of death, but let there be no shrinking back in unbelief. Let there be no abandoning of covenant hope through faith in Christ. If you are trusting Christ, even as your faith waffles and wobbles, God has you firmly in His grip. And whatever your lot he will continue to teach you to say and to sing, it is well, it is well, it is well with my soul. Let me lead us in prayer. Oh, Father, we rejoice in this true, living, real, blessed hope that you give to all who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that for any of us who believe, we do so not because of anything we've done or decided, but because of your gracious, merciful, regenerating work in our souls. And so we thank you for this hope. And we thank you that in the same way you never left Abraham, so you never leave any whom you have brought to yourself through faith. And so it's in that very faith that we look to you now and we thank you for being the shepherd and the overseer of our souls. Indeed, you are the strength of your people. You are the saving refuge of your anointed. So Father, may you save your people, bless your heritage, be their shepherd, and carry them forever. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.